Grab your favorite caffeinated beverage and get cozy because you are listening to Mindful as a Mother with Paige Bruce and Lindsay Adams. Do you want to make a podcast? Spotify's got a platform that lets you make one super easily. Then you can distribute it everywhere and even earn money. All in one place for free. It's called Spotify for Podcasters and here's how it works. Spotify for Podcasters lets you record and edit podcasts right from your phone or computer. So no matter what your setup is like, you can start creating today. Then you can distribute your podcast to Spotify and everywhere else podcasts are heard. Video podcasts are also available on Spotify. With Spotify for Podcasters, you can earn money in a variety of ways, including ads and podcast subscriptions. And best of all, it's totally free with no catch. This is what Paige and I use for this podcast, and it seriously makes it so easy. It's easy to record, edit, upload, put the show notes in, and it's free. So if you want to start a podcast, use Spotify for Podcasters. Hey, hey, I just wanted to pop on here real quick before the episode starts and give a quick disclaimer. This podcast is not intended to be a substitute for therapy or the therapeutic relationship, and the information given in this podcast is purely for educational purposes and is not intended to replace the advice of a professional. Now that that's out of the way, I really hope you enjoy this episode. Remember to subscribe, rate, and review if you enjoy it because it helps the podcast grow. And don't forget to be peace, be love, be mindful as a mother. Hello and welcome back to Mindful as a Mother. Today we are talking about like clusters of symptoms and symptoms associated with ADHD. Yeah. And I'm here with Paige as usual. Hey guys. What were we going to say next? We are just going to segue. Wait, have you seen this show on Hulu called The Parent Test? No, what's that? It's a new one, and I actually am really interested, and if any of our viewers have heard it yet, they take different groups of parents and classify them in non-traditional parenting style ways. So there's like routine, there's intensive, there's structured, like hands-off. So all these like random parenting technique labels... And then they present different challenges each episode for the parents to parent their children through. And it's like a pass or fail situation. So trigger warning for your own inner critic, if you choose to watch it, I think there's like two or three episodes out on Hulu right now. I was very aware the second I turned it on, I was like, oh my God, I'm already trying to associate myself with one of these groupings of parents with a pretend parenting style and like making judgments, which I think is the purpose of the show to pull Mm -hmm. that emotionality. But I think it's a really interesting, like, experiment if you want to watch it and see how you feel about it. Oh, maybe we should watch it tonight. Which one? um, We are staying in an Airbnb in Burley, Idaho, which is beautiful, by the way. Everyone's like, why'd you go to Burley? It's pretty here, okay? And it's halfway between us. (laughs) And we are doing Podcast Weekend, recording a bunch of podcasts. Um. So that's why I said maybe we'll watch it tonight because we're going to be like snuggling on the couch watching parenting shows like The Therapist. <laughs> like The are. Therapist we are. What I love about it is each parenting group you can see they really are trying to be uplifting and one of them even mentions that the purpose of the experiment is to understand different parenting styles and different situations from different parents and maybe reflect on their own parenting and things that they would like to include or maybe lighten up on. So I really like that piece of it. Which parenting style did you associate yourself with the most? I think I parented one that was, or I identified with one. I can't remember what they called it. New age, maybe? Because it was a lot of mindfulness. It was like the new age parents, and they had like a bunch of piercings and tattoos. And it was like, I'm not going to force, like, so the challenge was eating at a restaurant, like really fancy food. They're like, I'm not going to force you to eat. I'm going to ask that you try it. And if you don't like it, you don't have to eat it. Which is very much an approach I take with with food. I'm like, you try it, you don't like it, right on, we're moving on. We need to go on that show and our parenting style is you're a therapist. That's it. That's it. Therapist in the wild. Yeah. Out of office. Yeah, out of office. Therapist out of office. 
So with that, one of them is very routine. They wake up every morning at six o'clock, very structured, and they have like a point system. So I was thinking about how I get up every morning at 5 a.m. and I'm like dead by 10 a.m. But this morning, I slept in a little bit and then we were able to start our morning with probably our favorite focus supplement. Oh yeah, Magic Mind. Yeah. Which I was just going to say, we are recording like so many podcasts back to back this weekend and doing so much work that... I don't think I would have been able, will be able to do it without Magic Mind or would have been able to. We're like in the morning. So I've got the rest of the day, but I'm already feeling like focused and on the flow state. Um, Just like ready to hit it hard. And we did our little boomerang. We did our little shot together. Yeah. That's what I love is that little, it's like a two ounce green smoothie shot filled with nootropics, antigens. A little bit of caffeine for your girl. It's like natural caffeine though, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, someone tea. was asking me about that. Yeah. And I have it in conjunction with my morning cup of coffee, but it really helps me stay focused and I don't I don't crash the same way later or feel like jittery. Yes. And it, it helps me like, I feel calm, focus. Yeah. It's not like fight or flight focus. Yes. Which makes me panic and like ping pong around, which we'll talk about. We'll talk about ping ponging today too in our episode of ADHD and me. <laughs> That's what I just called it. Trademark. Wait, don't trademark that. I'm sure I'll get canceled. <laughs> Anyways, Magic Mind actually increased our discount code, and pretty much all the mamas I know that are like, "Hi, oh, I'm crashing by the afternoon." I've been recommending it too because that's been my favorite result is I don't have the same afternoon crash. But now you get 56 percent off, and so if you go to www.magicmind co forward slash motherhood and use our code motherhood m-o-t-h-e-r-h-o-o-d you get 56 percent off of this supplement which is pretty incredible that is incredible yeah and i mean i think you notice how you feel the first day but if you take it consistently like it's amazing Mm -hmm. how focused and productive and in in the flow state you feel yeah at least, I think they recommend at least 15 days, which I totally support because I've taken it for 15 or more in a row, and it's just been incredible. So, slight disclaimer, we're going to ping to ADHD and me. So, what I want to use as our disclaimer for this episode, we're working on Chapter 1, Your Brain's Not Broken, by Tamara Rosier, PhD. She's a specialist in ADHD who has ADHD herself, and so do Lindsay and I, which is super helpful for this particular podcast. But the disclaimer is information on ADHD and neurodivergence is helpful and um, it it presents differently for each person. So just like we typically recommend, I want you to take what works for you and what applies and leave the rest, okay? So how many of us are on TikTok? Raises my hand. Literally all the time. It's blowing up right now. And there's recently a study completed that I thought was so interesting because ADHD is kind of a hot topic right now. And I think a lot of people don't know that originally the studies used to diagnose ADHD were completed on like middle-aged white men, right? Mm -hmm. So it's not, the information is harder to apply to females, especially middle-aged females. Kids too? Yes. I think, wasn't it? Boys. Yeah, young boys. Because the stereotype of ADHD is like a hyperactive uh, boy. externally hyperactive, which we'll get into. Mm -hmm. And so right now there's like a wave, since more research and information is coming out on how neurodivergence and ADHD presents, specifically for women. Welcome to Mindful as a Mother. Uh, (laughs) There has been a wave of like recently, um, like, not, I'm not going to say middle age because I don't think you're middle aged till you're like 50, personally. That's I know Tim always belief. says we're middle aged, and I'm like, I feel like I'm quarter aged. Like, I'm like, a baby. Like, I'm so a mental. I'm, like, I'm a third could. age. Yeah, I'm a third age. So, anyways, us of the uh, millennial generation, can we say that? Elder millennials? <laughs> I, think, I think I'm an elder millennial. Uh, are, are being diagnosed late in life, right? And so now we're starting to understand how it's impacting us, coming up with the brain hacks and the workarounds. But the study that came out was 55% of TikToks about ADHD were classified as either misleading or false information. Oh. Isn't that wild? That is wild. So I was like, y'all need to be checking your sources. I wonder, too, if some of it is that every neurodivergent person has such a different experience Mm -hmm. that people are sharing about their own personal, like, 
experiences with ADHD. Mm -hmm. And that's why it feels misleading. I don't know. I think the parameters are rough, but I felt like it was a really good example of make sure you're getting your information from a trusted source, right? Because there is also a big wave of self-diagnosing happening with our younger Gen Z pop. Mm -hmm. And you know what's so funny is I wrote in my iPhone notes and like my content or like things to be talked about. It's like how much of your healing happens in your camera roll and your screenshots and your Instagram feed and your TikTok feed. And are you like using discernment when looking at those things? Ooh, that's a good one. Yes, yeah. discernment and self-awareness. Like we want our level of accountability. And why? Why are we looking into it? Are we doing it to excuse our behavior? Or are we doing it to take accountability and find workarounds for the differences of our wiring? Good point. Mm. Intention. What is your intention? Yes. Mm. More about intentions. Mindful as a mother. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So chapter one is called... Let me look because I didn't even remember. Mm-mm-mm-mm. And then ping goes my brain and it reminds me of one of those machines at the arcade. What are they called? Pinball? Pinball machines. See? Ping, ping. Ping, ping. Ping, ping. <laughs> and then I have an example of this actually the other day where I was working from home. And so I was uh, going to the kitchen to make coffee But then I passed by like dirty socks on the ground and I was like, oh, before I start my session, I could throw on a load. So I turned around to go grab the laundry basket and put it in the laundry room. And then I was like, oh, I forgot to eat. So then I went to get a protein shake. And then in the process of getting a protein shake, I passed by my empty coffee cup and I was like, oh, I forgot to make my coffee. So then I went to go make my coffee. And then I was like, I'm really pinging here. Like, I need to buckle down and focus on what I'm doing. So I ate, because that supports me. Mm -hmm. Then I made coffee, and then I went to my room to work. But that's just an example of one of the, like, real-life symptoms of ADHD. And I, I feel like that's something I struggle with every day, especially when there's a time crunch, like the morning routine, or I need to be somewhere at a certain time. I have to really, like, center my brain and focus and and think like, okay, what do I need to do to make getting to work happen? And, and anything else is like not a priority right now. So if I see dirty socks, I cannot be distracted by that. Like I need food, I need coffee, I need to get the kids ready, I need to get myself ready. And those are the only priority. Yeah. So that's a workaround. It's Mm -hmm. a hack. So because the research wasn't originally designed for adults and women or females, I don't know. I don't know where I'm going with that. Identifying. Yes, yes, identifying as females. So what they're finding is a lot of adults are now being diagnosed later in life. And so the author talks about how in her research of her PhD, she found that it impacts currently about 5% of the adult population. And this was before the big blow up of us understanding so much more. So we get a lot of people coming into her office and they're like, I don't understand what's happening I'm, like, worried I'm going to get fired for one little mistake at work all the time. Like, all of these different issues that impact it and difficulty with time management and organization. So something that I love that she mentioned is that not only does adult ADHD exist, but it also has an impact on your quality of life. And so most people that have ADHD had it in childhood. And they will continue to experience those symptoms throughout adolescence and adulthood. But it, how it looks will shift as you become more sophisticated in your approach of life. That makes sense. And I think a lot of people who become parents and then are diagnosed wonder like, well, is this just something I'm struggling with now that I'm a parent? Mm -hmm. But it's really that like your workarounds aren't working anymore because the demands of life are more than your ability to cope or your workarounds. And so that's where you're seeing a struggle. Yeah. So it's shifted. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And I loved that because I was like, our dynamics of our life and systems are continually shifting. Mm -hmm. So something that might have served you before doesn't serve you in the same way now. Yeah. Or you may have had like the space and time to have like a morning routine that fully supports your ADHD brain, even though you didn't know what that was. And then now you have kids or your schedule changes or there's a shift and it just isn't possible and you're wondering why you're struggling more. Mm-hmm. And it's because that system doesn't work for you anymore. So when we're yes. talking 
system implementing, which is a big part of managing ADHD, it's important to be flexible and allow the system to shift when needed or the skills to shift when needed. Exactly. But if you don't understand what the symptoms are you're experiencing, it makes it much harder to recognize and create systems. systems. Yeah, it all starts with the awareness. You have to be aware of what's going on to create the system for it. Yes. So today we're building awareness on symptoms. Okay. Okay. So the first one that we're going to talk about is trouble directing and sustaining attention. So what I love is there is a misconception that when you experience ADHD, you have difficulty paying attention where it's a misconception because it's not necessarily false, but it's not true either. You often are paying too much attention to everything at once. I want to give you a real example in my life of how this shows up for me. I cannot have a conversation if I can hear other people's conversations. I am too distracted with like, unless I'm so into the conversation that I'm like hyper-focused, I cannot. So if I'm like on the phone and there's people talking in the background, I can't do it. I just can't. Or if like, you know how phones are weird sometimes and you can hear yourself talking. Oh yeah, the echo. I can't do that. I cannot focus because it is too distracting for me. I am too aware of it and I literally cannot tune it out. Yes, that's a very real example. And so that going in with that is your sensories are picking up a lot of things all at the same time. So it makes it hard to focus. And then there's also the uh, emotionality of it. So when we are emotionally invested, like the part of our brain is emotionally invested or interested in something, mm-hmm. you can sustain attention for an extended period of time. Mm-hmm. That's, that's what we call hyper-focus. Yes. Right? Yes. So with that, with hyper-focus, I think what's important to recognize is that it applies to things we're interested in and not to things we're not. Mm-hmm. So oftentimes we come across... Um, like lower priority tasks and we're procrastinating them. No, lower priority tasks, we don't procrastinate because they're easy to accomplish. So I'm going to get that dopamine rush real quick. Like this is super easy to do. So I'm just going to do it right now. Mm -hmm. And then it's like, oh, immediate reward. Or if it's something I'm interested in, it's much easier to focus on and do. But like, let's say reading the book for my book club right now that I'm not super interested in, very, very hard to sit down to make myself focus on it. And applying this to kids, I think that, um, so it might be tasks that are easy, aren't interesting. And so they have a hard time completing them. So this could be, why does your child struggle with completing like the really easy assignment that's due every day in class, but they can do like a full on book report on a book they chose and they're interested in. And it's because they don't have that motivation factor to force themselves to do something that they aren't interested in. And kids don't have the awareness enough to get the dopamine reward because a lot of kids like aren't naturally and they shouldn't be because they're kids Mm -hmm. invested in grades. And so they, they don't see the immediate reward from like, if I do this assignment every day, they, all they see is like, this is boring. Yes. And I boring is a word you hear a lot from an ADHD child. Yes. Boring. (laughs) Yes, exactly. And so I love the emphasis on understanding that we have a hard time paying attention to something that isn't inherently interesting or emotionally engaging, but then if it's like something we're interested in. This is why in our business, very real, this is real life, like and we talked about this a lot this weekend, um, like I don't do the organizing. I am not the one who organizes like the podcast episodes when they come out, the scheduling. I don't do emails to arrange the guests like Paige does all of that because I literally cannot make my brain be interested in that I just cannot yeah it feels very very hard and I I really enjoy it that's something for me but I'm not I don't really enjoy marketing but I love the marketing piece yeah so like that's me and so that's why our partnership works so well but also it's a very ADHD thing and it's an example of ways that like our brains are naturally interested in different things because we both have that but we mesh well together in that way Yeah. So here's something that I hear often and that I wanted to bring up on this specific episode of the podcast, because oftentimes I'll be like, oh, well, you know, it needs to be an area of interest or or engaging. Okay. And so then it's like, oh, well, my kid just doesn't care enough then. No, it's not that they don't care enough. It's that 
kids are naturally intrinsically motivated. And so if it's not intrinsically rewarding, they, they're not going to do it. And they don't have the skills to make themselves care about it. It's like, we have the skills Mm -hmm. to say, like, I know that I need to respond to this email or like, there will be a consequence because I'm a grown ass adult, right? You know what I mean? (laughs) But like, they don't have that yet. And so we have to help them. And this is where rewards come in. And um, it frustrates me that in the gentle parenting, and I hate that term, but I'm going to use it because like people understand what I mean when I say that community they kind of like harp on rewards a little bit or like using rewards based or behavioral interventions I think they have a time and place what Mm -hmm. I don't like is a ton of negative consequences and those things Mm -hmm. but I think for a child with an ADHD brain you have to teach them how to structure their life so that there are those natural rewards so like for us we talked about like the novelty of like a cup of coffee that we really like and that's naturally a reward. I bought myself a real cute notebook this morning so I could do an exercise in planning that isn't naturally like for my brain. Yeah, That's the reward, right? And so we have to teach our kids how to have that and that can look very different and we'll get into the systems later in the season but knowing that it's not that your kid doesn't care, it's just that they don't have the skills to create the workarounds and our job as a parent is to create those. Yes, I think you make an excellent point. And so something actually that came across our Facebook group recently was a specific reward system that I really appreciated and could help start to lay a foundation of like easy rewards, right? To motivate behavior Mm -hmm. for kiddos with ADHD. So, and all kiddos. So something just a blanket statement is all children's brain development is just not at the level of adults, right? Mm -hmm. It sounds... Like, obvious when I say it out loud, but sometimes we just need a reminder. Kids are not many adults. Yes, they are children, and their brain needs to grow. And so, this system could work for even if you are neurotypical or your child is neurotypical. So, what it was, it was like smiley faces and frowny faces. And it was a very simple system, and then there was a ratio for the reward, and you adjust the ratio of smileys to frownies depending on age. So, it was like, the example given was two siblings bickering and so each time that they were able to speak to each other with kindness and respect instead of fighting they got a smiley face and when they ended up engaging in like physical or verbal altercations they got a frowny face and if they got four smiley faces and no more than two frowny faces within this window of time then they got a they got a reward and then you just adjust the ratio to what feels like appropriate for their age like is four too easy like do they need to earn more or less frowny faces. Um, And the individual tried it and they really liked it. They said it was really successful with their kids. And then we talked about other skills, like problem solving skills. So every time that they went and got mom for help, instead of engaging in the fight, they got an extra smiley face. Love it. To like reinforce the skill, right? And so I think that system could be really supportive. Yes, and I also want to um, add in that sometimes it can be about age. And when we say age, that's based on like your normal, um, like developmental level. But some kids may need to start at a different level and then adjust as they're growing and that's okay. Yeah. Yes. And I think too, something, one another one I like is kind of like a token system where it was like, we collect a certain number of tokens and then we get to turn in tokens for a prize. So mm-hmm. it was like every chip that's earned is 10 minutes of like desired interesting activity right like usually it's some type of screen time or video game so it's like oh you did your chores this morning here's a token they collect their tokens and then a designated token turn in time that's how much like they get to turn in those tokens to receive that reward that's really cool yeah i really like that one too so i think that those could be two really nice build-ins for that and we could we could go off on this forever i'm sure on different like ways to build in breaks etc breakdown steps but as far as like creating an interest there it's not that our kids don't care they don't have the skills so we're going to try to teach them the skills by teaching them rewards and even as an adult when i would like need to do an important assignment i would buy like a jar of peanut m&ms and each like paragraph i wrote i ate a peanut m&m because that's what i really wanted and basically like being an adult is doing a bunch of shit you don't want to do so you can have time and energy to do the stuff that you want to do. Yes. And so we have to teach our kids that. Yes. 
And it's a skill. And the things we want to do are the motivating factors. Mm -hmm. Yes. So the other thing that we talk about is the, um, wait, what did you say? And like forgetting those conversations. It's not that we don't care. We're not invested in the conversation. It's the same thing with our children. It's that the difficulty in sustaining, like all of a sudden our mind is wandering. We didn't mean to Mm -hmm. situation. So it's not intentional defiance, which I think it can be interpreted by parents a lot. Sometimes it is, but we're going to give them the benefit of the doubt at this point and be like, oh, this is, so you need to speak less, basically. Mm -hmm. Give short, direct information. We're not doing long extended explanations. This is the lesson that Sam has taught me in parenting because he is neurodivergent with ADHD and autism that I need to just say less all the time. Say less. The one rule from... The anxiety professional that I took all of my training and certifications from was speak 95% less to your kids when you're managing anxiety. I think it's the same when we're giving directions. Speak 95% less. Like, how can I get my point across in as few words as possible and then provide, like, positive reinforcement? We can call it rewards. We can call it bribery. I call it positive reinforcements. Reframing. Look back at last episode. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Say less. The next, say less, queen. So the next symptom is hyper-focusing, which we touched a little bit on. But I think I want to specifically talk about hyper-focusing because it's not a normal type of focus. It's a deep and intense concentration where typically we forget time. Like time is non-existent. Mm -hmm. Internal cues are non-existent, like hunger and thirst, um, because we're so invested in the activity Mm -hmm. and it's it's so interesting and basically so rewarding for our brain to be invested in that activity that we ignore all of the other things. So again, it's not a character flaw. We're not just ignoring things because we want to want to play video games all day. But video games is a whole other episode all on its own. But it's more of like, hey, we're hyper-focusing on this and we need to learn the skill to interrupt it to meet those basic needs. Well, and I think that's where you also have um, tantrums and meltdowns with transition in ADHD is when – your child is hyper-focused on an activity that they enjoy, mm-hmm. and then it's time to transition out of it. You see meltdowns, and parents wonder, why are they having a meltdown every time I'm telling them that they need to stop playing and clean up? And that's like, well, they were hyper-focused on that, and so we need to create a system that helps support them in transitioning from that hyper-focus yes. to the next thing. Yes. With my kids lately, instead of saying, okay, I'll give you 20 minutes. And then when the timer goes off, we need to be done. I still use kind of the same format, but I rephrase the question. So now I say, how much time do you need before we get in the bath? How much time do you feel like you need? And it's usually a a fairly reasonable amount of time. Like they're not telling me like a hundred hours. Usually it's like 20 minutes. I do that too. And it gives the the sense of like autonomy and control back to the child. So like they feel like they got to pick mm-hmm. also the ki- the ages of my kids, like they have very little awareness of time. And so like, they just feel like they picked the time and then I set the timer and they're like, Oh, I chose that. So when the timer goes off, there's not a power struggle over it because mm-hmm. it wasn't me saying it's time now they chose that. Yes, exactly. And so with my four year old, who's also neurodivergent, the power struggles are real. So trying to hand back as much power and autonomy, I want everyone to try to really focus on disengaging from power struggles. You will never win a power struggle against a toddler or like there or any child. It, everyone loses. So how can we disengage and instead be collaborative, right? So I ask, how much time do you feel like you need? I'm so distracted by the fact that you are using uh, like a product registration. Is that for your new stove? Yeah. As a bookmark right now. <laughs> it's what? Oh, it says dryer on it. It's for my new dryer. Okay. So I'm going to be out here flexing my appliances. Scrubbing. Everything broke It's down. a GE. GE does have the best washers and dryers. It was good. It's good. It has a very, very loud sensor. But everything broke down all at once, so. Okay, sorry. That, I, that was my squirrel brain. I was like, she is using a dryer warranty. Is that a way to remind yourself that you need to fill that out? Yeah. <gasps> Look at that system you put in place for yourself. Yeah, it's my workaround. So that way this is – this podcasting we do so often that it's a reminder. And it's like a mundane, boring task. I don't really want to fill it out. So I'm struggling to get it done. But it's there reminding me constantly. It's nagging me constantly to get it done. Okay. All right. Sorry. <laughs> to register my dryer for recalls. So that's another real-life example. Navigating life. 
Okay, next we're going to move into hyperactivity or restlessness. And when I say hyperactivity, usually what comes up is like the wiggles, the running around, the bouncing, the jumping, all the things. I want you guys to stay tuned this season because we're going to have Kelsey, the sensory therapist, on as a guest to discuss the sensory system in ADHD and regulating that, which a lot of that jumping and movement is part of a sensory seeking behavior. But aside from that, There are ways that hyperactivity and restlessness show up for children and adults that aren't like the stereotypical ways. It's internal. Yes. So it shows up external and internally. So externally, excessive talking, not being able to stop movement even. So like excessive multitasking, doing a lot of things all at the same time. So like multitasking, like mental tasks, but also physical tasks and like bouncing around. Um, the pinging, it's like the the pinging of the body, basically. Racing thoughts is a big one. Yeah, so internally is racing thoughts, which I run into this a lot because people are often diagnosed with anxiety mm-hmm. and rumination and um, the symptoms of the brain, including thoughts associated with anxiety, present differently than ADHD. But sometimes if you don't know the right trigger words, people don't pick up on it. So it's like, okay, are we ruminating? Are we focusing on this one thought and trying to solve this one problem and replaying it in our head over and over and over again? Or are we thinking about this thing and then this thing and then this thing, which reminded us of this thing? Those are two separate types of Yes. And that was me. And I do have some rumination, but like it was a game changer for me when I recognized, and I was a a therapist at this point, but that's where they say like the education and the research has been so lacking. Yes. Right. But like when I realized that like, Oh, and it's when I started taking medication. I know we'll talk about that later. But, like, um, when I started taking medication, I realized, like, oh, shit. This is an anxiety. This was, like, ADHD thoughts. Yes. And it's very hard to tell the difference. So I work um, with some individuals who really struggled with that. And they were consistently diagnosed with anxiety. But for somebody, like, we know our tribe, right? Mm Mm-hmm. We know our tribe. Once you know and experience the symptoms, it's very easy to point out the patterns and symptoms in others. And so when she explained to me what was happening, I knew very clearly it wasn't rumination. And so then we were able to work with her medication provider on adjustments and reassessment, et cetera, because that was her main complaint is like, I cannot slow my mind down ever, no matter what I try, no matter medications, et cetera. And that was the main barrier for her and having like a joyful daily experience. Mm -hmm. So I want people to know that. And this quote actually from the book that I was like, every adult needs to hear this is that an ADHD expert, William Dodson says the vast majority of adults with ADHD are not overtly hyperactive, but they are hyperactive internally. So it's also that bodily sensation when you create more body awareness of just like general restlessness, like you need to be moving or doing something consistently even when you're, like, not. I have a question for you. Yeah. Is that social conditioning? Like, have we all learned to mask so well that our internal stuff is off the charts, but we've learned to control the physical part of it? Mm -hmm. I really feel like, and obviously this is all speculation, and Lindsay and I having this conversation with you guys. This is just like us having coffee together. This is not, a like... (laughs) <laughs> you're not in a doctor this is here. not a therapy appointment gina yeah. yes. okay we okay. love you we support you this is educational this is educational only for Wait. free why'd you use gina i don't know damn gina that's <laughs> um so in the beginning of the chapter when we talked about how you experience symptoms your whole life but your approach to them changes mm-hmm. as you move through life or how you manage them changes when you have more experience with life, I really feel like that's a lot of what it is. When a lot of us have that, like, we click pens, we tap our toe, we, like, a lot of that fidgeting mm-hmm. is some of that movement that's been, like, socially conditioned. We find socially acceptable ways mm-hmm. to, to meet those sensory needs that either stem from ADHD or they're just sensory needs. And some of it, I believe, um, and this is, educational purely speculation is deeply rooted to like moving emotions through our body absolutely in trauma because we talk about like animals shaking and how that is how they like move emotion and i deeply believe that we've been like conditioned to not move our bodies and move emotion through us like we would especially when you move into adulthood play is so underrated as an adult and dance and i'm 
and free movement. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, and there's a lot of science on emotions existing as a type of energy, right? Mm-hmm. So whatever emotion you're experiencing, the hormonal cocktail inside of your body exists as a type of energy that needs to be moved through your body. And when we talk about like hacks or tips or systems, um, and we talked about emotional intensity as one of the things. Was that the last episode? They're all blurring together yeah. at this point. Yeah. Okay, but anyway, um, like a tip I have for that is to move. If you are neurodivergent or your child is neurodivergent, move the emotion through your body. You're experiencing an intense emotion. Go on a walk. Get up and pace around. Um, I was stuck earlier, even creatively. I was going to say creatively. Okay, whatever. Creatively. And I... And we're in this Airbnb and there's room. And I told Paige, I'm like, I'm not going to write this down. I'm going to get up and walk around and talk it out. And it like came out beautifully Mm -hmm. because I allowed my body to do that. But if I had like not been in a safe space to do that, or if my social conditioning had taken over, I would have just been stunted and then be like, why can't I think? Why can't I plan for the future? Why can't I express my vision? Right. And I would have been stuck in that mental trap. So giving your body and yourself the permission to like get up and move or do what feels good or, um, but also rest too. That's the other part. But yeah. The permission to rest. And we can move into it. And so one way that this builds into parenting with the type of restlessness, like hyperactivity usually because children are babies. So they haven't had as much social conditioning or brain development to mask the same way necessarily as we do as adults, right? So hyperactivity displays in children more often than adults externally, externally than adults. Mm -hmm. Um, That we can like pick up on. The author talks about wearing bracelets she can fidget with or pens or things like specifically built into her day that she can fidget with that are socially appropriate. They have those rings too that like spin. Yeah, the spinny rings. I really enjoy a poppet. Not all poppets are created equal. What is this thing called? Um, uh, where's my phone? Um, the back of my phone is. I don't have a pop socket, but those are fun. I have like a ring that I fidget with a lot on yeah. the back of my phone. Yeah, and I have a pop socket. So something um, that we do that I build into with my children, especially when we're having frustrations with homework, is uh, brain breaks. Mm -hmm. And it's not like it doesn't have to be anything big and extensive, but she completes a a frustrating piece of her homework. And no matter what amount of time that took, and I support her and like right now it's the hoverboard. So she gets on the hoverboard and like uses her elbows and is like, I'm a snake and like rides it around the house. I love this. (laughs) I need to see a video of this. (laughs) So I'm like, yeah, you could take a little break. And so she'll just, I'm a snake in the different parts of the house. And then she brings herself back, focuses, does another chunk, and keeps going. Like, we just build in the ability for that movement to release those emotions that we don't necessarily have the opportunity to um, get out while we're sitting and focusing. And this leads into, like, a much bigger conversation about how our school system is fucked. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. um, how we are not struck we are structured in a way that does not support where our kids are at developmentally whether they're neurodivergent or not um but especially if they are neurodivergent and as a parent the best you can do is advocate for your child and then create those things and teach those things at home yes so throughout the season we will be talking about how to advocate and we will be having interviews on education advocates which is actually like a side profession of people you hire to help support you through that system with the school district to get the accommodations you feel like are going to be most successful for your child um and how to build in some of that stuff at home also and accessible resources so hopefully all that helps for you and also for your children because some of those resources aren't as easily accessed or even known about. That mm-hmm. could be really supportive, like occupational therapy and speech therapy. Mm-hmm. Okay, the next one, impulsivity. Lots of that. Lots of that. Everyone kind of knows what impulsivity is. It's a spinoff of hyperactivity and restlessness kind of like married together. And what I loved is the emphasis that they talked about how when – Somebody is impulsive, they, you know, act before they think, right? Kids naturally do this because of brain development, but also adults do this. And it looks like interrupting in conversations. Like, and I have the perfect example for this as an adult that I had to catch myself. And it was um, somebody that knows our family gave our children Christmas gifts, which was a very kind thing to do. And we're not particularly religious, but they got them each like an age appropriate Bible devotional book. And I was looking through the one for my eight year old and it just is like shirtless men because it's an illustrated children's devotional. 
And so I, I is it white shirtless men? White shirtless men. I always I always got to ask if it's like white it's, Jesus. It's white Jesus <laughs> and white shirtless men and angels. And I was like, "There's a naked man on this page." And then I turned another one. I was like, "Why is this book filled with naked men?" Really loud. So that was what like impulsively I was just like reflecting, and I caught myself where I was like, "Why is this?" And then I stopped because my brain caught up to what it was saying, like Love the impulsivity, it. because I knew that the the person that provided the gift wouldn't, it's it wasn't socially acceptable. Like they would have been terribly offended, which wasn't my intention. But like, why are there so many shirtless men in this children's illustrated book? Like, I'm kind of not okay with, with my eight year old having a book of shirtless men. <laughs> and at least make them like historically accurate. accurate. Yeah. yeah. Like if you're going to put. <laughs> That's a whole other podcast. Go check out our other podcast, Historically Accurate Representations of Jesus. Um, but that was like a, a real life adult impulsivity move. And I often interject in conversations or I go on side tangents. But Which it, is why I'm talking about your dryer warranty. Yes. Yeah, instead of the- impulsivity. So when you have impulse problems, staying patient can be really challenging. And that's for adults. So think of it as kids who don't even have the skills to be patient yet because the brain hasn't developed enough. And then additionally, so like those those marshmallow challenges crack me up. Or I'm like, <laughs> eat the marshmallows. And this is where, too, you see adult behaviors like um, kids do some of the food ones too, but binge eating, impulse spending, mm-hmm. b- uh, budgeting can be really difficult. Um, I'm trying to think of other things that are like uh, buying all the things that have to do with your current hyperfixation yeah the hobby it's really hard to not just go balls to the wall and buy all the things yeah 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 for like to be a scrapbooker when I like secretly like I'm not gonna scrapbook for more than a day because I have ADHD and my interests change very quickly yes exactly so those that's impulsivity I really like that it talks about for better or worse we dive into headlong we dive headlong into situations and find ourselves in potentially precarious circumstances Which I just like potentially precarious circumstances because I'm like shenanigans. Mm -hmm. I'm always on a shenanigan. Mm -hmm. You are the definition of a shenanigan. I'm a shenanigan. I'm I'm like, let's go get in the car. We're leaving. It's shenanigan time. Yeah. Yeah. Was fostering a dog a shenanigan? It was a shenanigan. I became impulsively, I put myself on the emergency foster list at our local shelter and now there's a puppy at my house. I mean, it's a very cute puppy. It's very cute. And it's partially a great thing, which... If you know me in IRL, in real life, I love a Great Dane. Mm -hmm. We are on our second Great Dane because they don't have very long lifespans and it makes me really sad, but I love a Great Dane. Yeah. So in December, I came across a post with a bunch of puppies and every once in a while, I just want a puppy. And so I messaged them and I was like, do you guys need fosters? And they were like, yeah, actually. And usually the process is really complicated. So it's like a natural barrier to, to the impulsivity, right? It was not a very complicated process. They just took my name and they're like, we'll call you. Literally called me right then. We, um, every dog we have ever brought into our home has been, with the exception of one, has been like an impulse situation of mine. Yeah. Like I show up at our house with a dog and Tim is like, what the fuck? Yes. Lindsay, another one. Like. Yes. Literally shenanigans all day. And my husband is so supportive of my shenanigans I appreciate him but then they the shelter was like oh well we partnered with this other shelter so you'll need to call them and see if they still need fosters and I did and they're like we don't need any right now so it's like oh you know impulse averted right there's mm-hmm. the natural barriers typically I act on impulses of a nat- and there's a natural barrier there or my husband tells me no which is helpful um but then they call me I just me. don't talk to my <laughs> So I, that's my way of – no, I'm just kidding. Just kidding. I mean, I've gotten better. To, uh, like, it's taken me 11 years of marriage to, like, get Finally better. say yeah. something. Yeah. Sometimes I won't tell him. That's how we got the cat. He just It's like if I know – cat there. Tim does not like cat. Like, I would – that is, like, the D word, like, divorce material if I brought a cat home. Oh, no. Same. Cats are not the jam for him. It's, it happens all the time. But then they called me on Friday and were like, actually, we need an emergency foster. Can you come? And I went. Obviously. And we, I was there with him. No one says him. no to a puppy. And I was like, the world, the universe decided for me. But this is such a great workaround. I want to talk about this. So we're like, we're teasing you about your puppy shenanigans. But like, how cool is that that you can like foster a puppy that then gets adopted out to someone else yes. permanently? So when that wears off or when you decide, mm, I've had about enough of this, 
you're not the then puppy's adopted tied to this yeah, dog to a loving home yeah and i gave it yeah. love and basic training this is why i was like this is good for me yeah and so some of adhd is finding out how to hack your life which yes. is why we're doing this i'm like i can't actively keep all, all the, the puppies, puppies. <laughs> and you constantly have a puppy because the yes. puppy phase is the cutest it's like constantly having a newborn yes but with more sleep hopefully i don't know all right and so we are on to our last symptom that we'll be discussing for this episode and it's difficulty managing emotions which we really touched on um last episode mm-hmm. <laughs> i keep saying episode and i'm like am i saying the right word yeah yeah, yeah yes sorry, right. episode so um, a lot of the times it's difficult for individuals that are neurodivergent to manage their emotions because they feel with great intensity and are very sensitive. So will you just do a quick recap of rejection sensitivity dysphoria? Yeah. So with rejection sensitivity dysphoria, you take criticism, rejection, even the slightest thing is like you made a spelling error here <laughs> or um, like someone breaking up with you, even though you've dated like a week as like physical pain, your body perceives it as physical pain. And so that's why um, you see really large emotional reactions to things that are small in proportion. This goes back to your, like big bucket, little bucket. I like that even yes. for adults, but also remembering that this is your superpower and that you feel, um, gratitude, joy, um, excitement just as deeply as you feel like pain and disappointment and rejection and fast up, fast down. So if you go up really fast and you like don't resist and you like move it, typically you can move through emotions more quickly. Now I know someone's going to comment probably on TikTok and say that like, well, my kids tantrums last for 45 minutes. So pass fast up, fast down doesn't apply. And I'm going to challenge you and say somewhere in there, you're trying to like resist the emotion on some level. Mm -hmm. And also like fast is subjective. Fast is subjective. Yeah. This reminds me of my middle kiddo who I wouldn't traditionally classify as neurodivergent. So this is a great example of how to just apply this in your parenting regardless. Mm -hmm. I am aware of what comforts her. Most of us are if we take the time to attune to our children. Mm -hmm. Attunement is intentional. Shameless plug, take my tantrum tamer course, or quiz. Yes. At the link in our TikTok, Mindful Mm -hmm. as a Mother Follow. Yeah. So what she does is she has this really high-pitched, like, wail because she feels really intensely. And so she'll have this really high-pitched wail. Most adults are like, I can't handle this noise, right? But what comforts her is that that connection, mm-hmm. the physical connection and a hug mm-hmm. um, to comfort her. And then it comes down much quicker. So I actually had this question from somebody yesterday, last night. And they were like, how can I, like, how do I, how do I help her work her through this? Because I just can't handle it. And I was like, as, as off-putting as the behaviors are, if you bring her in for that physical affirmation and like that comforting touch, the emotion will subside much quicker Mm -hmm. than if you resist. Mm -hmm. And that's just in general true for yourself, Mm -hmm. right? Like what do you need in that moment? Meeting that need. That's what we mean by allowing it. And body attunement. And what do I need right now? Yes. And also for your children, like what do they need? And by consistently being able to attune to them and help them provide it for themselves or like one of my kids needs space. And so now she has learned after we've talked about it several times and I've supported her in it to ask for that space and then she'll come back. But the the sooner that you can meet the need, the quicker the regulation occurs. Agreed. Okay. So finally, when should I seek a diagnosis? What about medication? So what I want you guys to know is this, this is general information about ADHD, how it presents for us, how it presents in people that we've met, and if it resonates with you. Um, and you're like, maybe I should seek a diagnosis. I want you to ask yourself, is this impacting my daily functioning in a negative way? Is this making it hard? Are the things that I'm recognizing and resonating with making it hard for me to feel successful in my social life, my personal life, my marriage, in parenting? If that is yes, or even in your job. If that is a yes, it could be beneficial for you to seek a diagnosis, to feel some relief and validation and to learn some skills or workarounds or hack your brain, right? Um, If it's a no, and this information is just helpful, there really isn't a purpose in seeking a diagnosis. Mm -hmm. Would you consider that accurate? Yeah, as an adult, I think for kids, um, it can look a little different 
when it comes to like dealing with the school system and sometimes yes. a diagnosis is necessary which and I've talked about this before but like one of the reasons this is not ADHD but one of the reasons I fought so hard for an autism diagnosis for Sam is so that the a medical diagnosis not just a school one was that so if I ever need the resources in the future mm-hmm. like we're not using any of them now but it, it makes it easier to advocate for him at school and to um advocate for those resources later if I need them. Yes. So with children, what a diagnosis does is it allows access to resources you probably wouldn't already have access to. And it helps your insurance cover them. Yes. And that's what insurance does. They demand a medical diagnosis. So for children, oftentimes if it's impairing the relationship, like parent-child relationship, impacting social relationships, and like academic um, I usually recommend seeking a diagnosis and receiving like resources and services so you can get the wraparound. You'll have more more success in teaching these skills and having your kid feel successful when you have the wraparound service. Mm-hmm. And um, seeking the diagnosis is a means to medication, but it doesn't have to be. Yes. And that brings me to medication. And this is the phrase that I love, and it's that pills don't teach skills. Mm-hmm. And so the author and Lindsay and I, in our own experience, will talk through how medication will impact everybody differently. So for some people, it is wildly successful. For others, it helps a little, but like not as noticeable and you can take it or leave it. Okay. I want to share something that <laughs> I, I've got to find like the exact study, so I might be misquoting it here. But I saw a study statistic that talked about how a lot of people worry about like amphetamines specifically to kids and when we talk about amphetamines everyone gets a little because methamphetamines but that's where they came from so amphetamines Mm -hmm. are um, the class of drug that is often used not always but to treat ADHD and um they and we talked about like addiction and how a lot of people who have addiction or substance abuse disorders have are dopamine seekers, Mm -hmm. meaning they don't naturally have enough dopamine. Mm -hmm. And that if they were to be medicated or have the skills and ways to receive that dopamine naturally, they would not have substance abuse issues. So the thing we're worrying about by giving our kids amphetamines, if they truly need them and have the diagnosis, actually may be the thing that's preventing them from having the substance use disorder later in life and that's why it's important like it's case by case so like some kids makes them a zombie not a great thing some kids it's and and it's it's hard medicating kids is hard um medicating adults is hard but and it's not for everybody but like if that's your concern look into that and keep that in mind because you may be unintentionally setting your child up up or yourself up to seek dopamine in unhealthy ways like excessive shopping substances yes. and all of those things by not treating like the root cause of it yes. and pills aren't always the thing that helps the root cause it yeah. it pills not skills right yeah pills don't teach skills, skills. Maybe and, need to sure this and so it. even as successful as medication can be it is used in conjunction with the things we've talked about the resources available and learning the skills to be able to hack your brain or do those workarounds to support an overall like holistic view of the person like just because they you medicate your child doesn't mean they're magically going to understand body awareness right we have to teach them body awareness and the medication is going to support them and I tell this to every parent who's asking me as a therapist about medication and our licenses, this is for educational purposes, our licenses don't allow us to talk about medication, spe- specific medications, because we are not doctors and we are not trained in that. But yeah. um, I think it's important to like look at the pros and cons and what your fears are when it comes to medication yeah. and the research. And all the research shows that people, kids, adults, anyone, have the best outcomes when they are properly medicated and in therapy yep and and i think that that can be now this hasn't been researched but like widened to like um they are learning the skills and then taking the pills if they truly need them or if they're beneficial yes absolutely and that ends season three episode two understanding some of the signs and symptoms of adhd for you and your kids okay we'll see you next week bye bye Thanks for coming to Mindful as a Mother podcast. If you'd like more of us and Mindful as a Mother, you can find Paige at Instagram at Parenting with Paige and Lindsay at Lynn's underscore Adams LCSW. 
Find us on TikTok, Instagram, and in our Facebook group, Creating Community and Smashing Parental Stigma, Embracing Mindful Motherhood and Positive Parenting. Thanks so much and see you next time.